bed off. I had my day off. It was my day off. I was lying in bed. And then my wife gives me a call and she says, turn the TV on. That's what uh, 911 happened. So 21 years ago, wow. I didn't think I was getting that old. Let's see here. Um, a couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, Monday prayer, 5 p.m. Wednesday Bible study. Skip won't be here again. He's, uh, I missed one more Wednesday. Yeah, Skip. He's, he's on, he just loves being on vacation. So. <laughs> no, I think this is a duty thing. So, uh, But Wednesday we'll be covering, Mario will be covering the, the, the third chapter of Titus. That's, that's on Wednesdays. And ladies Bible study still right on Friday. Friday at 9.30. You guys had what, 20, 20, 20 what? 20. 20? Wow, that was, it was jam packed back there. I, I saw that photo. I think that study's going to be pretty good. The word, they did the word. That's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. Also, we have men's breakfast, uh, actually, next Saturday, but that's uh, Spanish speaking only. So if you, you're invited, you can come if you want to. But uh, uh, someone, uh, we just kind of started that recently, and people liked it. So we're going to continue doing it until. Uh, that's in Spanish, and then the first Saturday of each month, of course, we still continue our uh, our, uh, our normal um, men's breakfast. Somebody uh, suggested that um, I guess some of you maybe are are interested in in a home Bible study. I think I mentioned that last week as well, and I think there was a response to that. So we have a teacher who's willing to do that, but we need a home. So if you want to volunteer your home get with me and then we can work it out the time and the date it'll probably be on a Tuesday we don't know exactly what time but uh, we have a teacher who's willing to do that if we can just get a home we want we want other people to get involved in in, in providing you know being part of the ministry in that aspect uh, so if you're willing to open up your home during the week probably on Tuesday in the evenings if you are willing let me know and we can uh, work on that we're also going to start another, uh, uh, kind of revive it, I guess. It's been uh, dead for a while, but we'll revive a, a Spanish Bible study on Tuesday. Uh, and basically all that's basically is going to be is we're going to just kind of cover, go over the Sunday's message because uh, mostly in Spanish, the, the, the people who go there, they, they need more discipleship than you guys do. <laughs> you guys are mature saints and uh but in the Spanish ministry, the, 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 the people, they, they, they're, they're less grounded, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And I think just God, God's put it in my heart to, to begin that, to just to explain in more detail or, you know, with question and answers kind of a thing on, on Tuesday, <coughs> Spanish Bible study as well. So that'll be at my house on Tuesdays. I don't know exactly when we'll start it, but um, see, why are you guys telling me? We don't know any Spanish. <laughs> So you guys can pray about it, that's why. So. All right, let's uh, open our Bibles to Romans chapter 4 as we continue in the book of Romans. We'll be <coughs> reading from verses chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. The title of the message is Faith Illustrated, so let's stand. Verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. <clears throat> now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those <coughs> whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Father, we truly are blessed, Lord, because our sin were nailed at the cross, Lord. Done, sealed, forgiven, forgotten, Lord, and we thank you for that. It's only because of your grace and your mercy, Lord. Father, as we study your word, help us, Holy Spirit, to understand, and not only that, help us to apply. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can be seated. 
A faithful nun spends her work, her life working in a slum in a poor country, feeding the poor, ministering to the sick and dying, and caring for the orphans. As she nears death, she is asked, she is asked, why should why should God let her into heaven? She replies, because I have devoted my entire life to serving him. I have denied myself for years. I hope that I have done enough good works that God will accept me. She dies and faces God's judgment because her faith was in her own works, not in the shed blood of Jesus Christ alone. Meanwhile, on death row, a serial killer awaits execution. He mercilessly tortured and murdered many. A chaplain visits, visits this killer and finds that he has been reading the Bible. God has convicted him of his terrible sins so that he despairs about dying and facing God. He knows that he deserves God's judgment, but the chaplain shares that if he will believe in Jesus Christ, who died for the ungodly, God will forgive all of his sins and credit Christ's righteousness to his account. He does believe and goes to his execution at peace with God, and he spends eternity in heaven. These two stories are very plausible, right? And I guess, you know, it's not, nothing out of the extraordinary on these things. And maybe as we hear those and kind of in your mind saying, well, that's not fair. I mean, that's not fair that this lady, good old lady, you know, that, uh, that she would not go to heaven. Look at all the things that she did. And why is this guy, this killer, why is, is he going there? And so I think in our mind, we, we, we kind of get that, don't we? We kind of say, no, that's not quite right. Well, not according to us, maybe not, but you know, according to God and his grace, that's where grace comes in. Because that is a reaction of many, right? The belief of many is because this nun did a lot of good work. She deserves heaven. And this murderer, he deserves to go, you know, to, to go to hell. But again, salvation by grace through faith alone is perhaps the most attacked doctrine in the Bible, right? Because all religions, all false religions teach some kind of salvation by works. And Satan likes, wants to, and he does, he brings confusion to this area, right? The salvation by works that somehow only good people or you have to do good things or stuff to be saved. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, many denominations, again, as I mentioned, many denominations, they believe in, in, in Jesus. They believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in Jesus alone. They believe in the scriptures, but not the scriptures alone. They believe in grace, but not grace alone. They believe in faith. They believe in the blood. They believe in all of those things, but not alone, because they always want to add something to those things, and that is not true salvation. It has to be alone. Always, always add rituals to it. What You guys know what the most popular hymn is? You guys know what it is? Anybody know? What is it? Amazing grace. That's right, amazing grace. You know, and the Bible speaks a lot about grace. Paul is known as the apostle of grace. We sing about grace and we believe in grace, but we still struggle with grace, don't we? We struggle with grace. We say, well, no, no that can't be possible. There has to be something that we do to be right with God. <laughs> How can a person, you know, and, and that's, that's, again, that's the, 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 the mentality of most and maybe of some of you be, uh, here today. And that, that is the message of our text this morning. In his grace, God justifies the ungodly, that murderer who, who does not work for salvation, but yet that good person faces eternity apart from God because she trust or they trust on, a, on their own good works. Let me just remind you the, just, the definition of justification. Justification is the sovereign act of God whereby he declares righteous the believing sinner while he is still in his sinning state. In other words, while we were still prone to sin, God saw us in Christ and said, I declare you to be right in my eyes. You don't have to work to find, to find favor with me. That's basically what it is, right? Grace, it is, it's just nothing that we can do for it. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't do nothing for it. It's free grace. It's free. All because of what Jesus did on the cross. Remember Paul, as, he, as we've studied Romans, the first three chapters of Romans, um, he's, already, he's already established a fact many, many, over, many times over, especially in, cha in chapter 3, is that no one is saved by good deeds. Chapter 3, verse 20, it says, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Verse 22, it says that the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus, verse 24, says justified freely by his grace. 
And to support again his argument of justification for, uh, uh, apart from works, Paul here in chapter 4, he's going to give us two Old Testament examples in David, in Abraham first, and then in David, right? Because again, he wants to prove that, that if Abraham, who lived you know, years and years before the law and years b before Paul wrote Romans, that if he can't be justified by faith, well, guess what? We can't be either. No one can. And then, of course, he'll also give the example of, of David as well. David, you know, all the things that he did and so forth, and yet God, he was justified, not because of what he did, but simply, again, because of God's grace. Again, if, if the Jews, uh, you know, they, rec they saw Abraham as their father, if their father couldn't be saved, well, neither could their children be saved by works, right? So that's what we want to examine this morning, uh, faith illustrated in both Abraham and, and David as well. Just three points. The example, and we'll begin here in verse 1, uh, the example of, of Abraham. You want to start in verse 1 again. It says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? So again, this is the, the, the example, the, the perhaps the best example in all the Bible of, of faith, of faith. We can see that in Abraham. So not only does, you know, this example is going to prove that no one is, is justified by works. You know, Paul is also saying, look, it's always been this way. Even in the Old Testament, it's always been the same way of salvation. It's justification by faith and not of works. Because sometimes people will ask that question, don't they? Well, how were people saved in the Old Testament? Jesus hadn't come. He hadn't died. There was no cross. Well, it's in the same way that we're saved in the New Testament, by faith. Except in the old, they look forward. In the new, we look back to the, to the cross. So the, it was the same thing. And remember, the, uh, Paul brings Abraham as well because um, if the Jews, they, they adored Abraham. They revered Abraham. To him, he was like the, the, the patriarch. He was the man according to them, right? And they loved him. You know, they even, the Jews even justified that Abraham by, was saved by works by using extra biblical examples. For example, in Jubilees 23.10, it says, Abraham was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord and well-pleasing in righteousness all the days of his life. That was extra, extra, not biblical, you know, it was in the apocryphal books and so forth, but that's what they believed. Manasseh chapter 8, verse 8, I mean, it says, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not need to repent because they did not sin. <laughs> that's what they taught. That's what the rabbis taught them. So that's what they believe is that Abraham somehow didn't need justification or that he was justified because of his works, of his good works. Again, they held him in high esteem. John 3, 8, remember uh, when, when Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees there? And, 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 and they're having like a little discussion there. And what does Jesus, what Jesus say to them? Well, he kind of offends them a little bit. And they say, well, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. Remember that in cha John chapter 8? And then he says, yeah, he, he's our father. So they trusted. They relied a lot on, on Abraham. But John the Baptist, you know, he uh, kind of corrects that belief. He says, look, it's not enough to be descendants of Abraham. You have to bear, you know, fruits worthy of repentance. Again, they thought that they, everybody else needed to repent, but not us because we're God's chosen. We are the Jews, right? Isaiah 41, quoting, uh, later on quoted by James, is that Abraham was called a friend of God. So they said, look, he was a friend of God. Uh, so obviously he had a special relationship with God. In Genesis 26, 5, speaking of Abraham, God says, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Again, they would use this and other scriptures to say that, that Abraham obeyed God, that he was righteous with God because of the things that he did. But what they failed to recognize is that Abraham's faith, his obedience, was only the evidence, the proof of his faith. It wasn't the cause of it, right? But notice again how Paul begins here with, with these Jews again. He talks about Abraham our father right um, it, that's a good a good a good lesson a good example for us good principle here for us he doesn't begin by insulting them and I brought this this uh, this point before when we witness we want to witness to others don't begin by insulting people here right uh, don't begin they might be wrong and maybe they do a lot of things wrong but don't begin by well how can you believe that and how can you be, worship that and blah 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 right says Abraham our father he establishes that relationship look I'm one of you guys uh, he is my father too but again yet he wasn't saved he's going to correct that false that false impression that he is now 
So he begins here, he begins here, Paul, with this illustration of Abraham. But notice he asks a question. He says, what did Abraham, I'm paraphrasing here, what did Abraham our father do in the flesh to be right with God? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> he didn't do nothing to be uh, justified before God. Notice verse 2, it says, for if Abraham is justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God, if he could be something that says, yeah, he could boast. I did these things and all that, but you know what? He couldn't boast before God because, again, he had nothing to boast about. Because who was Abraham? You know Abraham, right? You know, you know the story of Abraham. Yes, he obeyed, but you know what? You know what? He, when, he was, when God first called him, who was he? What was he? He was an, a pagan idolater. That's who Abraham was. Why did God choose him? Because he chose him. Why did God choose you? Because he chose you, right? <laughs> Nothing good that we can't do that we can learn, and that's why he chose him. And then afterwards, remember when, uh, when he called him in Genesis 12, it says, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house. And then in verse 4, it says that Lot went with him. Do you read anywhere there? It says, take Lot with you. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't say, it says, get out of your country. He says, get, leave your family and go to a country that I'm going to show you. And yet Abraham disobeyed and took Lot with him. So again, and when he's there, when he goes, he finally leaves from Canaan. He's in Canaan. There's a famine that happens, and what does he do? He goes down to Egypt. What does that prove? He disobeyed. God didn't tell him, hey, go down to Canaan, go down to Egypt. That shows that he disobeyed God. He not only disobeyed God, but he mistrusted God that he wouldn't provide. And yet also when he goes down, what does he do about Sarah? Oh, he's my sister. Right? And he does that twice. He's my sister. He lies about it again, not trusting in the Lord. And Paul's point in this, in, 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 in bringing up Abraham again, is, is that, look, Abraham had done nothing to brag about. And actually, he had done some bad things that he had done. Right? He was an idolater, a liar. He disobeyed God and so forth. How can he be justified by works? That's Paul's point. But they would, again, the Jews would use other extracurricular uh, verses. In James 2.21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up uh, Isaac, his son, his son on the altar? Well, they twist that and say, well, look, there it is. James says it. But again, if you, if you know what James is talking about, right? James is talking about from a different perspective. What they fail to see is, is that James is talking about the evidence. The evidence of salvation is works. It's not they, that, that James was saying that he, it was, that he was doing works to be saved. And the same thing goes for us as well, right? When we, when we do, when we are saved, we ought to be doing works. Because again, that is the fruit of our salvation, not what we want to do as earn, for, uh, earn our salvation. Philippians, man, I think Skip covered here the last time that he mentioned it, where it talks about work out your salvation. Notice what it says, work out your salvation. It doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work it out. Okay, you're saved now. You know, do works that are worthy, that are, that are evidence of your salvation. When the Jews asked Pete Jesus, again, when they asked him, he says, what is the work that we must do to the work, do the work of God? What did Jesus say? He says, believe. Believe on him who he has said. So that was the work. And it wasn't a work. Belief is not a work. So that's what he said. This is, I like what D.L. Moody, how he puts it. He describes uh, salvation apart from works. This is how he, he puts it. He says, the thief had nails through both of his hands so that he could not work, and a nail through each foot so that he could not run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or a foot toward his salvation, and yet Christ offered him the gift of God, and he took it. Christ threw him, in a, pa threw him a passport and took him to paradise. Right? So again, the thief didn't do nothing. He couldn't do nothing. He was on the cross. And then, yet, he says, Jesus told him, today you will be with me in paradise. Because he had believed what, that Jesus was the Christ, right? And again, Paul, remember, Paul being a religious Pharisee before he came to Christ, he knew what the, this, how these Jews felt because that's how he used to be as well. In Philippians 3, it says, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And then Paul goes on to list all the things that he did, you know, all the things that, that he depended on before Christ. And then it says, but whatever, gain, what, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And then in verse 9, it says, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith.
That is the answer right there. It is the righteousness by God. What is it? But it's by faith alone, not in nothing, anything that we can do or earn. That is the message of the gospel. The gospel is that we don't deserve. All of us deserve the judgment of God. But in his grace and his mercy, God has sent his only son to pay, to be our redeemer, to pay for our sins. Let us share in verse 3. In, chapter, in verse 3, uh, it says, But what does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Again, in context, it, Paul is talking here to, to Genesis 15. And let me just read you the first five verses of Genesis 15. You don't have to go there if you don't want to, but let me just read you what, uh, in context, what the scriptures say about what Paul is talking about here. In Genesis 15, verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring, and indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look toward, now towards the heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall you, your descendants be. And this is what the scriptures say, what Paul is quoting here in Romans chapter, in verse 3. It says, And he believed in the Lord. Lord, and he counted in him for righteousness. That's what the scriptures say about Abraham, how he was justified, that he believed in the Lord. You know, and again, like I said, the Jews quoted many other scriptures, but they weren't biblical scriptures, right? The, the, Paul says, what does the Bible say? And that is good for us to know as well, you know, that the Bible is our ultimate authority. The Bible, for all godly things, racial things, the Bible is our ultimate authority. It's not what does the pastor say. It is not what does the pastor think, right? I'm sure you guys didn't come here to, just to hear me talk or to get my political views and so forth, right? You came here because hopefully, you know, we were going to read the Bible, we were going to read the Bible, and God was going to speak to us through his word because that's what the scriptures say, right? Don't all of us want the reason that we come here? We want to hear what God, the message that God has for you in the in, for you and I, right? And it's really always through his word. What does the scripture say? Now in context, it, it is about, it's about Abraham's faith and how he was justified as far as, you know, what does the scripture say? But, you know, we ought to look for God's word for all things pertaining to godliness and for God and for direction from the Lord, right? We ought to, that's our Bible. It is our map. It is our, our guide. It is a lamp unto our feet, Psalm 119 says, right? The Bible is our our, our direct is our is just God's word to lead us to guide us and and so you guys heard that uh, what the Bible stands for B I B L E sounds kind of what is it basic instructions before leaving earth right sounds corny and childish and all that right but but it's true there's a lot of truth in there right you know these the Bible is God's instructions right while we're still here this is his word this is him speaking to us right and we all ought to know what does the Bible say what does it say Again, Psalm 119, it says, Direct my steps by your word. It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. To my path. If you wanted to know what does the Bible say, what, about, what does the Bible say about marriage? What does the Bible say about divorce? What about raising children or about husbands and wives, abortion, same-sex marriage, or fornication or adultery? What do the Bible say about these things? Do you think we need to find out what the Bible says in those areas as Christians? We do need to find out what the Bible says about because what the Bible says is the way that we ought to be living as Christians right what does the Bible say you know on Wednesdays it, when Mario he taught on Titus 3 on Titus 2 I mean and he taught the responsibilities the, the responsibilities and he mentioned you know the older women the older men the older women the younger women and the younger men and he talks about bond servants you know applying it to to employees and all that you know and all of that is biblical to us as well right because that's what the Bible says that we as older men older young younger young no no as older <laughs> Oh, there's, I'm sorry. Back to it. <laughs> right? That's what the Bible says. You know, how are we to be, how, what are we to, things that we ought to do, you know, as employees or, or just as children of God? What does the Bible say? Because, again, it is our instruction book, and we are so blessed, aren't we? Don't you feel blessed that you have a Bible, you have a 
that you're able to have a Bible in your lap right there, or whatever means you have, electronic, or you know, however you do it, right? Like Janice right there, she's holding it dear and dear, right there, she has it, right? It feels good to have a Bible in our hands, right? And to have that privilege. And you know, one of the things that came out of the Reformation was that, is that the Bible was translated into English, into the English language, so the common person could know what does the Bible say? Because until then, you know, you didn't, if you didn't know other languages of German and all, you, didn't, you wouldn't know what the Bible says. And that was okay with the priests, the Catholic Church, and so forth, because they didn't want people to know what the Bible says. And they kept people in ignorance of the things that God wanted to tell us and, and all of that, and specifically the area of how is a person saved. Because if there's one thing that the enemy wants to confuse, it leads to confusion, about it is how is a person saved and there's a lot of confusion there's a lot of error and there's a lot of deception in these areas right but you know we are to be like Bereans what does the Bible say that's not what am I saying what does God say in his word right again that is our ultimate authority one of the uh, recently well it's been a while now but on Wednesdays we uh, we had uh, different Bible studies where we just gathered skip was gone again no. <laughs> uh, and we, we had Bible studies. We, we, we took some uh, verses out of context, right, that are commonly taken out of context. And, you know, we had a good time just kind of studying them. Okay, that's what, you know, what it's, but this is what it says. This is how it's taken out of its context. But what does the Bible say in its context, right? And it was a great time just kind of kind of studying the scriptures, what does the Bible say? Always, if you want to find out what it says, what does the Bible say? I'm thrilled. I think I'm more thrilled than my wife with this new Bible study that you ladies started. It is about the word. I got the book the other day. I was kind of reading it myself. Oh, that's pretty cool. I want a copy of this, right? Because it, you guys are going to be saying, what? The word. What does the Bible say, right? What does it say? Uh, again, that is a great thing. Was, was that what you call a rabbit trail? I kind of went off a little bit of topic there. Kind of. <laughs> but uh, that's okay. You know, uh, I'm up here. and <laughs> So let's get back into context, okay? Let's get back into the context here. We were talking about the Jewish rabbis, how they would take con scripture out of context to, to say that Abraham was justified by works. But what does the Bible say? Was Abraham, how was Abraham declared righteous? Well, be Abraham believed God. That's why he was how he was justified, right? And belief says describes belief means describes saving faith. It's more than intellectual knowledge. It is an, an adherence to and a committal to a reliance upon or a trust in a person or an object. That's what belief is. Because people can believe, many people believe, the Bible says that even the demons believe and they tremble, right? But it's not just head knowledge. Believing is heart knowledge, right? When you know that you know that you know. It's not just believing, it's trusting, having a whole faith on what the Bible says. And we've already seen, right, that Abraham was far from perfect. You know, he lied and so forth and so on. But you know what? Even so, his overall life of Abraham was a life of faith and of trust in the Lord and obedience. You know that? Go, go read your, your uh, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is normally called what? The, the Hall of Faith, the Hall of Faith. In Hebrews 11, it mentions about Abraham. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out, go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went not knowing where he was going. And it says, by faith, when he was tested, uh, offered up Isaac, concluding that God was able to raise him up from the dead. To me, that is the greatest testament of faith right there. Which one of us would be willing to offer up our kids? Which one? None of us, I don't think we would be able to, right? Yet Abraham believed God, and he went and he obeyed. And he was going to kill Isaac, but yet, of course, we know God stopped him, right? But then notice he says that concluding that God was able to raise him up from the dead. What is that? Abraham is believing in resurrection before there has been a resurrection. That is the testament of his faith. That is the example, again, that, that, uh, that, that, the, that Paul has given. Yes, he had faith, but he, he wasn't saved because of that faith, right? It was only saved because of the righteousness of God was imputed to his account. And that word imputed or accounted, again, it's, and it, it, we've studied it before a little bit. It just means to, to put into one's person's account. And we're all familiar with that, don't we? We all use uh, credit plastic, right? We all use plastic to do transactions. And what happens when you, when you use it? Well, when you go to a store, you give them your car, or you put it in the machine, whatever, and immediately what happens? Your money is transferred from your account to that business account, right? 
you don't see it, but uh, unless you go afterward, you check it in your, in your, but that's what it is. It's something being transferred to another account. In this case, what was transferred to our account? Because we were spiritually broken before the Lord, right? We were broke. There was nothing. We were actually in debt. Our sins, we were in debt. But then what happened? God saw us, and what did he do? He credited God's, his righteousness into our account, right? And made us right, declared us righteous, because we're not made right. We are declared righteous. That's what Paul is talking about here, is that that's the only reason that Abraham was declared righteous, because God credited him with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, it says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins to them. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know, but this year, as far as, as, far as Abraham not being perfect in his faith, as far as being disobedient in that, you know, it, 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 I, I find comfort in that. You know that? Because if Abraham couldn't be declared righteous despite because of his for his because of his faith, that means that he floundered a lot of it sometimes, right? And you know what? I flounder a lot in my faith as well. You know that. So it brings me comfort knowing again that God doesn't look for perfection, right? That He doesn't justify the perfect person; He justifies the repentant person, right? That's whom He justifies, and I find comfort in that. So again, Paul has used Abraham to illustrate that, right? That God, by His sovereign grace, right, and nothing and had nothing to do with what Abraham had done. Abraham, in, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Let anyone should boast. Not even, and you know what? We can't even boast of our faith. Well, I have a lot of faith. Well, you know why you have a lot of faith? Because God gave it to you. That's why. Because we can't even boast because of, of that, right? It is, it's a, it is a gift of God. So that's the example. Now the explanation. Paul is going to explain it a little bit more, what he meant, what he talked about. Notice verse 4. Not to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But, it, but as debt. You know, he's going to give a clear explanation of what it means to count, and he's going to use the workplace, right? At the end of the week, at the end of the week, if you work, you know, the boss gives you a paycheck or he deposits it to your account. I think for most of us, it's probably a Social Security check now, right? And, you know, that that the uh, Uncle Sam puts in your account and all that. But you know the reason that Uncle Sam gives you or credits your account with that? You know why? Because he loves you. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't believe that? No? no? <laughs> he gives you money. <laughs> well, that's the point. That's the point that Paul is making here. He, he doesn't give it to you. They don't give it to you, right? This is something that you have earned already, right? That's what you've earned for many, many years of work. So when the government deposits money, it imputes or counts money into your account, you've earned that. That is not a gift. That is something you're, that is, that is the, the contrast that Paul is making here, is that wages, you've earned wages. You can't earn salvation. It is by grace alone. So that's what he's saying, Paul. Says that. Because if, if a sinner could earn salvation by, by good works, right, then God would be indebted to us to give us that salvation. But you can't earn it, so therefore it is, it is, then it wouldn't be grace, right? But on the flip side, notice verse 5. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is what? Is accounted for righteousness. Again, what is the work? Well, to be justified, it is belief and faith in God. And notice here how, how, whom God justifies. We would expect to read that God justifies who? The godly, the good person, right? That's what we would expect to read because that's what we kind of been kind of, you know, led to believe that, yeah, just be good, do good, and, and you'll be right with God. But notice what does verse 5 say? Just God justifies who? The ungodly. I think I've used this, but I, always, I, I use this example a lot. The Pharisee and the tax collector in, in, in Luke 18. Remember the, the Pharisee and the tax collector? You have a tax collector and the Pharisee there. And by all outward appearances, who would you say that God, that God would justify? We would probably say, well, it, it's the Pharisee. Because, look, he prays, he, and he himself says that, right? I pray, I give, I do this, I do that, and so forth. So, man, you must be godly, right? But who does the Bible say that went home justified? The IRS agent. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, by the way, the government's getting 80,000 more IRS agents to protect us because they want it really, you know, so. Hey. The Bible says that he, the tax collector says, he went to his house justified rather than the Pharisee, right? Again, God doesn't justify, he doesn't justify the good Lutheran, he doesn't justify the good Episcopalian, or the good Methodist, or the good Catholic, right? Or the good people that come to Chapel, Calvary Chapel Foothills. He doesn't justify us because of that. You guys are all good people, right? No? Some? No? Sometimes? God justifies the ungodly, right? The ungodly, that person who says, look, I'm be merciful to me, a sinner, right? That's the person who God justifies. That is the lesson, that is one of the lessons of the Beatitudes, you know that? In Matthew chapter five, chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you know what? It has nothing to do, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, it has nothing to do with being bankrupt financially, it has nothing to do with that. Blessed in the poor spirit, it could be translated, oh, how happy is a person who recognizes their spiritual poverty and turns to God for forgiveness. That is the person that God will justify. In verse 4, it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's not saying blessed are the crybabies, right? It says blessed are those who mourn, who cry over their sins because they realize that this sin keeps them away from God. They realize that. That is the person who God will justify. This is blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the, the, the earth, right? And it, if he translates, oh, how happy are those who are humble enough to admit how ungodly they are, causes them to mourn over their sin. That is the person that God justifies those people right there that mentioned here. Verse 6 is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Obviously, if a person hungers and thirsts for righteousness, what does that mean? Is that they don't have their own righteousness, right? So, so Lord, I can't do it. I can't make it. I need your grace and your mercy. That is the person whom God will justify. Luke, I mean, in Luke 5.32, Jesus, again, speaking something similar to this, he says, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And that is Paul's point, as Jesus is, is that none of us deserve heaven, none of us by our own good works. But you know what? By his grace and his love and his mercy, that's what's available to us when we recognize that we are sinners in need of God's grace, right? God justifies the ungodly, again, who come repentant to God, who are sorrowful for the sin. Remember David? David, Psalm 34? It says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Those are the person that a person will, that God will save. If, a God, if an ungodly person believes and trusts only and not their works, that is the person who is righteous, declared righteous before the Lord. So we go from the explanation to the encouragement. And in the example also of, of David, verse 6. It says, just as David also declared, describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Again, Paul is going to use, uses here David as an example, is that because if God would save a person because of works, in, like we mentioned earlier with Abraham, what could David present to God to be justified? What kind of works would he present? Well, we know what he did, right? We know <clears throat> the things that he did. David couldn't say, look, Lord, look what I've done. I committed adultery. I, I had Uriah murdered, right? And I lied and so forth, right? Here are my works. You think that God would, David would be justified because of that? And that's the point, again, that Paul is making here, is that even David, right, even David for those things, you know, he recognized that he, this, how sinful he was, and he cries out to the Lord, and then God says that, they, now David is saying, look, blessed, blessed is the man, you know, who just, who's got, just not, he would impute righteousness apart from works, because David could see that he didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve the salvation. But you know what? When he cried out in repentance, he says, Lord, thank you. Thank you for, for that. <clears throat> Look, verse, verse 7, the second part is, verse 7 says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Notice David doesn't say, Blessed are the powerful. As a king, he had all power, right? He doesn't say, Blessed are the popular. The women sang about David, so he was very popular. He doesn't say blessed are the prosperous, but as King David uh, had a lot of money, he was very wealthy, right? He doesn't say that, but what does he say? He says, blessed 
are the man whose sins are forgiven, right? Sometimes we, equa we equate blessings with health and wealth and materialism, don't we? Because sometimes people present the gospel that way. Oh, just come to the Lord, and God will give you health and money and so forth and so on, right? And God will bless you with all these things. And God can and sometimes does bless us materially. But you know that our blessings are not in this world. Our blessings, as Paul says in Ephesians, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly places. Where? In Christ Jesus. Those are the real blessings, right? And, and God has blessed us. I mean, I feel very blessed, right? I'm not rich, but I'm not dying. I mean, I'm not, not poor, right? But I mean, God, God blesses us. He blesses his kids, right? But again, don't think that those blessings are, are because we deserve to be blessed in that man. So David agrees with Paul, right? Is that the blessings, again, the greatest blessings in having our sins forgiven. That is man's greatest need. Take time to read Psalm 32, and we already sung Psalm 51. Was that Psalm 51 you guys sung? That David was, was uh, saying there, right? It means take time to read, and if you know the stories, if you know David's story, I mean uh, uh, David's story, and you know the background of Psalm 32 and 51, Psalm 51, right? It was at that time that Paul, that Peter, uh, Paul, Peter, James, and John, right? Peter, Paul, and Mary, is that... <laughs> is that David, David was unrepentant, remember? He was trying to hide his sin. And, and in verse 3 of Psalm 30, 32, says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old. He says, Though my, through my groaning all day long. What was David doing? He was suffering because he had sin. He had, un, he had sin that he had to repent it of. And David deserved to be killed by God. You know that? Because the sins that he committed, adultery and murder, were punishable by death. And that's why David, he knew that, and he felt miserable. He felt miserable. You know what? That's a good thing. When God convicts you of your sin, it's a good thing to feel miserable. You know that? Because if you don't feel miserable for your sin, you need to check your salvation, right? If God speaks to you, and you're living in some kind of sin, unrepentant sin, and thinking that God just winks at it or whatever, right? So you, need to be, you need to be careful where you're lying, right? Because, again, God knows. He knows everything. And God, David knew that, that God knew. He just didn't want to confess it. Because you know why he didn't confess it? Because he thought that God would kill him. Because it was punishable by death. And yet, what does he do after he confesses? He says, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you. And he felt blessed because of that. Because God forgave him. Let me read you a story here. Kind of kind of proves, proves uh, uh, this point. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. If you've heard, well, you're going to hear it again. If you haven't, you're here for the first time. <laughs> a little boy was visiting his grandparents. He was given his first slingshot and was get, having, a fun, having fun playing with it in the woods. But he never hit anything he was aiming at. But on his way home, he saw grandmother's duck, pet duck. He took aim at it and let the stone fly. To his horror, it went straight to the mark and the duck fell dead. The little boy panicked. He quickly hit the dead duck. Then he saw his smirking sister, Sally, standing by the corner of the house. She had seen the whole thing. They went in for lunch. Sally said nothing. After lunch, grandmother said, Sally, let's clear the table and wash the dishes. Sally said, oh, grandma. Johnny said he wanted to help you in the kitchen today. Didn't you, Johnny? Then he whispered to him, remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later in the day, Grandpa called the children to go fishing. Grandma said, I'm sorry, but Sally has to stay here to help me clean house and get dinner. Sally smiled and said, that's all been taken care of, Grandma. Johnny said he wanted to help today. Didn't you, Johnny? Then she whispered, remember the duck. This went on for several days. Johnny did all the chores, both his and Sally's. Finally, he could stand it no longer, so he went to his grandmother and confessed. His grandmother took him in her arms and said, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the kitchen window and saw the whole thing. And because I love you, I forgave you. But I wonder how long, how long you would let Sally make you a slave of sin. <laughs> that was David. David was, David was a slave to the sin, unrepentant sin. You know that? He was. He thought, I, I don't deserve it. I know what I deserve, right? The law says this. That's what he knew. That's what he knew. David knew that. He, he knew that he deserved to die, but yet, because there was no provision in the, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, yet when he confessed, he felt this weight, this weight. And that should happen to us as well. When we confess our sins, 
we do. Yeah, we deserve God's punishment. And don't think, though, that, that just because we deserve it, God's going to let us go scot-free. You know that? Yes, he forgives us. But you know what? Sometimes there's discipline as part of that. Just read David's story as well, the discipline that he went through because of that, right? But again, the Bible says that when we, when we, for, when we confess our sins, it God says God will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. He will remember them no more. Corey Ten Boom says, when, when we confess our sin, God, can, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. I believe that God then places a sign that says, no fishing allowed. No fishing allowed. You know, the enemy, he'll remind you. You know who else will remind you? Your wife might remind you, or vice versa. The point, right? Oh, yeah, I forgive you. Of course, I forgive you. But then later on, says, remember the duck. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you forgave me. I did. <laughs> But remember the duck. <laughs> you see, God is so good, right? He's so good. He forgets into the deepest ocean. And he says, hey, no fishing a lot. You can't bring him back up. And if I'm not going to bring him back up, we ought to not to bring him back up either, right? We ought to just, as we've been forgiven, we ought to do that. But again, there's consequences to sin. David paid the consequences, right? As his kids, as his kids, when we sin, God will forgive us. But you know what? Because he loves us, because we are his kids, there's discipline that comes with it, right? Again, read the story of David. It's horrible what he did, right? And the things that happened to him because of, of what he had done. So again, notice there's, and whose sins, notice David con continues, and whose, sins, uh, and whose sins are covered. The Old Testament, the only covered sins. Uh, the New Testament, they, they takes them away. Hebrews says it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats would take away sins. The priests offer repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Notice David felt blessed because his sins were covered. How much more blessed are we when God takes away our sins and removes them as far as the east is from the west? That's what happens in Christ, right? He's already taken the penalty for our sins. David says, verse 8, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. You know, it's our sin. It belongs to us. You did it. I did it. Belongs to you. But what does God do? He doesn't credit us with that sin. He takes it into his account. And what does he do in return? He gives us his righteousness. Who gets a better deal on that? <laughs> huh? You think we do or you think he does, right? Let me finish with this. This is a, li a little bit lengthier, but um, I think it just proves the point. This is a true story, by the way. True story. Look it up. True story. But it proves the point about that one, that God justifies the ungodly. Listen to it. Again, it's a little lengthy, but we got an hour and a half yet. <laughs> so years ago in the city of St. Louis, this is, uh, this is uh, William Newell speaking. Okay, He was a, he was a uh, pastor from yesteryear. It says, I was holding noon meetings in the Century Theater. One day I spoke on this verse, Romans 4 or 5. After the audience had gone, I was addressed by a fine-looking man of middle age who had been waiting for me. He immediately said, I am so-and-so. He didn't introduce himself. I am so-and-so. He says, and when I, he says, I am widely known in this city. And when I sat down to talk with him, he began, you are speaking to the most ungodly man in St. Louis. I said, thank God. What, he cried, you mean, do you mean you are glad that I am bad? No, I said, but I am certainly glad to find a sinner that knows he's a sinner. Oh, you don't know the half of it. I've been absolutely ungodly for years and years right here in St. Louis. Everybody knows me. I am the most ungodly man in town. I could hardly get him to keep quiet to ask him, did you hear me preach on ungodly people today? Mr. Newell, he said, I've been coming to these new meetings for six weeks. I did not think I ever missed a meeting, but I cannot tell you a word what you said today. I did not sleep last night. I have hardly had any sleep for three weeks. I have gone to one man after another to find what to do, and I do what they say. I have read the Bible. I have prayed. I have given money away, but I am the most ungodly wretch in this town. Now, what do you tell me to do? I waited here today to ask you, but I am so ungodly. Now, I said, well, turn to the verse I preached on. I gave the Bible to his hands, asking him to read it aloud, to him that works not. But, he said, how can this be for me? I am the most ungodly person in St. Louis. Wait, I said, I beg you to keep on reading. So he said, to him that works not but believes on him that justifies the ungodly. There he shouted, that's me. I am the ungodly person. Then this verse is about you, I assured him. 
but please tell me what to do, Mr. Newell. Now, I know I am ungodly. What shall I do? Read the verse again, please. He said, he read, to him that works not. And I stopped him. There I said, the verse does not say, the verse says not to do, and you want me to tell you something to do, and I cannot do that. I cannot do that. But there must be something I need to do. If not, I shall be lost forever. He says, now listen, now listen with all your soul, I said. There is something to do, but it has been done. Then I told him how God loved him so much, all un as ungodly as he was, that he sent his Christ to die for the ungodly. And that's Christ, and that God's judgment had fallen on Christ, who had been forsaken of God for, it, for, him, for him there on the cross. Then I said, God raised up Christ and, and sent us as preachers to beseech men, all ungodly as they are, to believe in this God, who declares righteous the ungodly on the, cross, on the ground of Christ's shed blood. He suddenly leaped his feet and stretched his hand out to me and said, Mr. Neal, he said, I accept that proposition. And off he went without saying another word. Next day, he shows up. He shows up at the same meetings again, and he asked to speak in front of the people, right? So uh, William Newell allowed him to do, that, to do that, right? And then he says, I want to tell you the greatest proposition I have found. He said, I am a businessman. I know how a good proposition. But I found one yesterday that so filled me with joy that I could not sleep wink at all last night. I found out that God, for, Christ, for Jesus Christ's sake, declares righteous any ungodly man that trusts in him. I trusted him yesterday, and you all know what an ungodly man I was. I thank you all for listening, but I felt I could not, tell, I could not help but tell you of this wonderful proposition that God should count me righteous. I have been such a great sinner. Isn't that a great story? It's a true story, by the way. True story. This man, he just said, felt he had the right attitude. He had the right conviction. I'm ungodly. I'm ungodly. God, I, I can't be right with there's nothing I can do. And yet, as Newell read in the scriptures, there it is. He says, you cannot work for it. All you have to do is by faith, by grace, trust in the Lord. And there it is, right? That's the same thing for us as well, right? There's nothing. I mean, again, the Bible, you know, the Bible, what does the Bible say? That is, that is a context, right? What does the Bible say about salvation? What does it say? It says what? That we cannot earn it. We don't deserve it. It's all because of the cross. What Jesus did, the blood that he shed. That all who would just put his faith and trust in the cross. God knows. He sees you, right? And he will forgive all your sins. Past, present, and future. All of that. Why? It's because of love, because of his grace. How can you earn that? How can you add to that? If you add anything to it, is it is no longer grace, right? It is no longer grace. You know, we minister, I think most of us, well, at least a lot of us, I know I do, I come from a religion of works. I do. I didn't grow up in it, but that's the religion that I was told that I was, right? It's works, works, do, 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 and so forth and so on. I mean, again, I never practiced it. But we all have probably family and friends who are still, because there's, this is still one of the main things, the main things. You have to do, you have to do, you have to stop doing that. Well, no, the Bible says it is, it is finished, Jesus says, right? Just put your faith in me. It is done, I've done. All you have to do is what? Is believe through faith by grace. Isn't that a wonderful proposition? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is finished. You finished it, Lord. You aren't finished, but your work, Lord, is finished, Lord. The work, the redeeming work, Lord. And all a person has to do is put your faith and trust, Lord. And by grace, through the miracle that you do, Lord, we shall be saved. And we thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. That was awesome. That was, that was beautiful, right? Praise God. Wonderful. Well, you know who qualifies for salvation? Sinners. That's who qualifies. Let's stand for a while.
who died, now glorified, King of all kings, Majesty, Majesty, worship His Majesty, unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise, Majesty, Kingdom of glory. Sunday, if you can make it, so have a great week in the Lord. Thank you.